gentlemen, if, if I could get everyone's attention, we're going to get started in just a couple minutes. I'm very happy to be here. This is uh, this is the 17th? 16th. 16th. Samuel's giving me this great introduction. And we're just going to, yeah, we're just going to slowly fade out. Soak it up. Just going to fade out. So, I want to thank you for uh, dealing with this... Uh, Pretty, pretty serious logistical conundrum of, of Clifton's cafeteria being closed. But here we are, and uh, Clifton's will reopen, Kim, on, on Wednesday? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we talked to the management, and they'll be reopening Wednesday, and it's really sad because I guess about 3,000 people are seeing Sunset Boulevard today at the Palace. Whoa. They have three screens today, and part of your ticket price includes a free piece of pie at Clifton. So, oh, no. I know, they're going to be... I know. I, I, there could be a riot. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm happy that I'm not the manager of Clifton. Yeah. Uh, I, I noticed that they were the staff was there yesterday cleaning up, but they're not there today. So they're obviously they've closed. They're going to put the gates down. They <laughs> um, We're going to get started in just a second. This is this is. I'm happy to have everyone here. I realize we lost a couple people probably because of the. The switch, but that's okay. They'll they'll, they'll trickle it. I, I'm very excited. We've got two great things today. We've got where's Gino? Our friend Gene Scalati is here, and Milt. Milt is here with the science fiction fantasy. Well, I'm sorry, science fiction fantasy society. And the, the, the irony is that the science fiction fantasy society uh, started its life not at Clifton's, but in the Pacific Electric Building, I believe, at 6th and Main, and then quickly moved to Clifton's Cafeteria, where they held court on the second floor for, for decades. And, and Milt will talk about that. So it's, it's sort of, it's like, the dogs bark, the caravan goes on, right, Terry? That's correct. The dogs bark, the caravan, <laughs> so we're here, and, and we're gonna get started. And so, Gene, you're gonna go on after Milt, and Gene, you've got more of your scrolls. Right. And and do am I correct in assuming that this is a good length? Do I need to worry about getting another table? I can. Well, we'll do it. Uh, we'll add another one. Go over there. Okay. You you let me know now though if you want another table and I can start looking. No, we we will finish. We can use those maybe. Perfect. Very good. And Terry, you're going to help us contextualize Gene because you you've curated Gene before at previous art walks. Happy to do. Good. Okay. Great. Okay. And I'm going to get your sandwich. So without without Samuel, if if you could. Thank you, my Thank brother. You. Thank you, Sarah. And I just, um, before, uh, before we get started with this, just a minor note, uh, we are here at the Los Angeles Athletic Club. We're really fortunate for a couple of things. First of all, the Hathaway family that runs the place, they're all in Hawaii. So, <laughs> Baruch Hashem. <laughs> the whole Hathaway family's gone to Hawaii. So, the staff is, everything's just coasting along. Um, all of our favorite staff are here trying to remind people to come up to the third floor. We don't have, we don't have anyone on staff today that, that there, there are one or two people on staff whenever we have guests, they just say no. <laughs> it's not the case today. Uh, this, this floor, this is the third floor. By the way, Raymond Chandler, my favorite writer, worked across the street at the Bank of Italy building. And in, in this room, immediately to, to my left, you're right if you're looking at me, uh, that, that room that was the bridge room, and every day from 11 to 1, everyone downtown, all the businessmen downtown, Raymond Chandler included, would come here, drink and play bridge from 11 to 1 in, this, in that room. Uh, they're going to start remodeling tomorrow this whole floor. Kim, how, how anxious are you? I have high hopes. <laughs> That it will be beautiful, and I'm sure it will be. We're, we're, we're a little concerned. Um, I'm just going to speak the Hathaways, always. I'm going to speak very casually. So uh, the, the last time I ran into one of the Hathaways that controls the parent corporation, LACO, that controls Athletic Club, that was at a hearing at City Hall for the proposed ordinance for interior preservation. And, and I, of course, spoke in favor of uh, historic resources being able to have City Council in, in, enact this historic, an ordinance for preservation of interiors, and of course, the Hathaway that, that runs LACO, the parent corporation of the athletic club and a lot of other buildings that club, where she was opposed to it. So, so the club, the Hathaways and I don't always see eye to eye on what they should do with their buildings, which is good. But um, I'm, I, we're just, take a good look, because they're gonna do a lot of work on this floor. 
Oh. And um, we're very hopeful. Huh? And we're just going to leave it at, yeah. So, Why? I don't know. Huh. Okay, so there we go. So just a minor note, and, and think of Raymond Chandler. And Mill, please, thank you so much for coming. I'm so sorry for the confusion with Clifton's being closed, but here we are, and you've got a great audience, and take it away. Okay. My name is Milt Stevens, and I'm here to talk about the Los Angeles Science Fantasy Society, which happens to be this world's oldest science fiction club. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about the club, and then I've got a handout, but I'm waiting a moment before showing you that. Okay, we are in the process of moving. The Los Angeles Glossus, as it is known, owns its own building and has since 1973. We initially bought one on Ventura Boulevard, but since having our own building was so popular, we immediately outgrew it and got a second one in North Hollywood, which we also outgrew. So now we're moving to Van Nuys from a uh, building that is a little over 2,000 square feet to a building that's a little over 4,000 square feet. So we'll probably outgrow that one also. Uh, we have our, we won't be moving until late August. We're not sure the date is yet. But on the handout that I pass out, uh, you'll find the address of the current place, the next place, the location of our website, uh, which you can get all sorts of information about uh, the Lost Vis and science fiction in general and probably anything else that comes up. We have our meetings on Thursday evening. Uh, in fact, in one site uh, we're titled Thousands of Thursdays. And yes, we've never missed a meeting since 1940. Before that, we were bi-weekly. So through war and peace and riot and flood and earthquake, yeah, we, we managed to meet one way or the other. Now, aside from our meetings, uh, we have a library, which is several thousand volumes. It's a circulating library, so it's not set up as a research library. Uh, we're concentrating on things that our members might want to read. And it also has a video uh, collection, which is becoming more extensive all the time. We run a children's reading program at the uh, Valley Village Library, and I think we're expanding to another uh, library. You know, in some cases, if you want to see youth corrupted, you've got to go out and corrupt it yourself. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> that's what we're doing, encouraging uh, children to read our sort of uh, literature. <clears throat> we run an annual convention, a lost con, which is held at the it's been at the LAX Marriott in recent years. Uh, it runs between you know, 12, 1,300 people. It's oriented more towards print, although uh, we also talk about movies and television and comics and anything else that strikes our fantasy, and almost anything might strike our fancy. But now that I've told you a little bit about the club, if you would pass out the uh, flyers I of artwork you have ever seen. It is from the March 1941 issue of Fantastic Adventures. You could barely miss that. And of course features Slaves of the Fishman by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Mm -hmm. uh, the cover is by um, St. John, uh, who was uh, J. Allen St. John, who was the illustrator of all the Tarzan books and just about everything that Edgar Rice Burroughs ever did. He's really pretty good artist, but there is a point beyond it's very strange. You know, there was one thing in the early days of uh, 
science fiction that, you know, men in the pulpit and people the critics uh, desk agreed on. Science fiction was not respectable. <laughs> you know, they weren't sure if it was work for the demon or just exceedingly bad taste, but they were sure there was lots wrong with it. Of course, H.G. Wells had been respectable, and so had Jules Verne, and uh, uh, Hugo Gernsback, when he found it amazing, tried to be respectable, but never quite made it. This was the sort of literature you carried underneath your coat when you went home. <laughs> you hid it underneath your mattress to make sure your mother would not find it. So when you met another person who read it too, you went, my God, you like it too? You know, it was like a long lost brother. And so, you know, people who uh, liked science fiction, when they got together, they were very tight. And uh, they formed, you know, clubs and networks of letter writers all over the world and uh, were more enthusiastic than the devotees of any other sort of literature you might imagine. But, all right, eventually the getting organized got more organized. Dick Lee came from the Science Fiction League, which was founded in 1934. Now, Hugo Gernsback had many high-minded purposes for science fiction, but his real goal with the Science Fiction League was to sell more issues of uh, wonder stories at the time. And all it took to form a League chapter was three people, usually three high school students. And most of them came and went in six months, some of them uh, the Chicago SFL was still around until 1952. Philadelphia is around to this day, but there were breaks in its history, whereas uh, Los Angeles was chapter four of the Science Fiction League, and it first met in a uh, garage on Des Descanso Drive in October of 1934. Since the garage was owned by one J.C. Reynolds, he was the first president uh, that much is known about Reynolds. He was a man of middle years, and apparently, like Dr. Frankenstein, he became horrified of his creation and fled, never to be heard from again. <laughs> but, um, but the lost was kept on going. We go over to the next page, and while well, I wish I'd gotten a little better photo quality, the photo at the top is Meeting 100, and this was 1940, and the people, there are better copies of this photo in existence, but over on the left we have the young Ray Bradbury, who wouldn't even sell anything for another 70 years, Forey Ackerman. Uh, we have, actually, Edmund Hamilton is at the back wall. He was known as the World Destroyer, sold a lot of science fiction. Uh, and pulpy kind. Robert Heinlein sitting um, a little to the right. You really don't see his full face in this one. And probably the best known science fiction writer present in this photo is E.E. E. Smith, who is seated in the middle. And he was the guy who introduced the galactic epic, particularly the galactic patrol and the Skylark series. And it was really, uh, you know, vast in scope. I mean, at one point where the bad guys launched three fully armed planets through a hyperspatial tube. It's, it's just got a <laughs> But yeah, some of the writers, uh, fandom and Lossus, uh, attracted people who wanted to be writers. Of course, at the lower left, we have Robert Heinlein, who later was known as the Dean of Science Fiction, wrote what was called realistic science fiction, in which he worked out the details much better than most who've come before him. And uh, the guy in the ice cream suit in that is Walter J. Dorothy, who was a prominent fan for many years. To the right is Forrest J. Ackerman, a man I think many of you have heard of. He's about 21 at the time of this uh, photo. Of course, over the years, all sorts of uh, writers have been a member, members of the Lospis. Uh, Robert Heinlein, uh, Henry Kuttner uh, was a member, A.E. Van Vogt, 
um, some lesser known ones, I'll get back to Cleve Cartmel, uh, Fritz Leiber, Alan Dean Foster, Larry Niven, Jerry Parnell, and many others that sold some fiction or other types of fiction too. It's sort of a place that writers tended to hang out. And of course, L. Ron Hubbard, since I was specifically asked before the meeting, mm -hmm. yes, uh, L. Ron Hubbard was a member uh, in the late 40s. And it was reputed that he threw some really great parties. <laughs> and what caused his, uh, him to separate from the Lospice was some other member of the Lospice ran off with one of his numerous girlfriends and he got pissed off and didn't want anything more to do with us. At one point, it wasn't minuted in our minutes, but uh, by word of mouth tradition, there was a meeting in the late 40s where Hubbard gave a demonstration of uh, hypnosis. Later, that became anathema in, in Scientology, but then again, Scientology didn't exist when he did it. Hmm. All right, um, this was at at Clifton's in the late 30s. Uh, by the World War II era, it had moved to, to Bixel Street, a few blocks from here, uh, by now, god-awful area. LAPD Central Facilities is over there. Also a parole reentry house. Uh, even armed police don't go on the street to the level uh, around Central Facilities building. In fact, there's only one uh, doorway out and nobody uses it. Uh, okay, in World War II, fans sort of created their own organizations. Over in England, of course, they were planning for the worst. Major collections were moved out of London, <coughs> contact points established out in the country that even if the entire country fell, they were planning on getting back in business someday. In LA, while well, there was worry, uh, the third, fourth World Science Fiction Co Convention would have been in Los Angeles, except people were afraid that there might be invasion. And so it was put off till after the war. But the Bixel Street meeting rooms kept open seven nights a week, so anybody that knew about it who was passing through town on their way west, uh, you know, could drop by. And there are many stories uh, of people using that uh, facility, and that went to entirely during the war, seven nights a week. After the war, well, you might think things had got better. But then came the next problem, Senator McCarthy. <laughs> and his era, you can't really say he, you know, threw the country into a, or put it under a reign of terror, but a reign of extreme discomfort, yeah, he managed that one. People didn't join anything. They didn't want to be around anything. Uh, and that was true of the entire United States. Fandom in the U.S. was on hard times, and the center of international fandom moved out of the country. It's usually been in the U.S. to, to Belfast, North Ireland, to uh, Walt Willis's place of Bleak House, and the various people who hung out there, uh, James White, and Bob Shaw, and others who became well-known writers. Okay, the next page of the hangout, or the handout, uh, shows us the last Christmas party of 1941. This was shortly after uh, Pearl Harbor, and yeah, things were going to change drastically and soon. At a, the bottom of the page was a picture from the late 40s. And all right, one of the things, as I said, Senator McCarthy, we got our own FBI snitch who had infiltrated the club in the late 40s. He is in this photo. And chances, I've asked people to, uh, you know, sort of take their guess on who the snitch is, and almost all of them pick him because he looks sneaky. <laughs> he is seated, second from the right. <laughs> he is the snitch. Oh. The thing is, but we're such a tolerant organization that when he showed up again in 1960, they didn't even throw him out. <laughs> but uh, for a long time, I hadn't connected it with another story that I knew. But uh, of why we would have a snitch, after all, we were a harmless group of crackpots at worst. That's what the FBI supposedly determined after much investigation. 
But earlier, in the 40s, science fiction had been wondering about the splitting the atom stuff. And what was in there? And almost everybody figured there's a weapon in there, but they didn't quite know what weapon. In 1943, Robert Heinlein published a story called Solution Unsatisfactory, in which, which he was betting on radioactive dust, carpet bombing a country with it. And it would work, it'd be an exceedingly nasty weapon, and one that I'm certainly glad that we didn't do. But then, in 1944, another loss was memory, Cleve Cardinal. He took another guess in a story called Deadline. It's a nuclear bomb. And that was published in Astounding 1944. And what's worse, he lived in Manhattan Beach. And so with Manhattan Beach, Manhattan a Project, the FBI put it together and landed with both feet on uh, John Campbell at Astounding and Cleve Cardinal. And probably in that uh, investigation, he probably mentioned the Lazarus, and later they figured out, well, yeah, maybe these people ought to be kept track of. But when Sam Russell arrived, there were no communists in the Lazarus. So he recruited three. <laughs> and I have uh, at least talked extensively to one of them. And uh, heck, when he was in the Communist Party, his supervisor in the party worked for all and I. So, oh well. But things, uh, while fandom and loss was declined in the 40s, uh, it got down, and even during the 50s, it was still going. Uh, by 58, we'd almost bottomed out. Three members showed up at one meeting, and things had to get better, or they just go fold. At that point, a woman arrived, Dejo Trimble, and she later became famous for the safe Star Trek, uh, you know, letter campaign, and to get the uh, shuttle named uh, Enterprise, and she was a spark plug in '58 who started the revival of the um, Lasvas. And, of course, the thing that really boosted fandom and loss was Star Trek. And suddenly we had these vast hordes pass through. Most of them didn't stay, but in general things got more populous. And conventions grew really large. Uh, well, the world cons, uh, initially it was thought there wouldn't be room in the United States for more than one science fiction convention a year, and that would be the World Science Fiction Convention. In fact, the first three had declining attendance and there was serious discussion that this science fiction convention idea is never going to work out. But then the war came. And so in 1946, the uh, uh, LA Worldcon did occur. And we've had a few more. Uh, usually they're rather major events in local history. Uh, the 1958 Worldcon was over at the Alexandria Hotel. Had all of 300 people at it. And of course, the Alexandria later became the address of choice of many of LA's leading winos. Yeah, I haven't been in or by there in years, and I don't know. I've heard at times it was making a comeback, and other times that it wasn't, but whatever. Okay, so 60s, Star Trek started growing. Then the next Worldcon, 1972 in LA was the first one with over 2,000. Then, uh, by 1984, uh, we had another Worldcon. It was 8,000. At this point, we started you know, making projections and going, oh my god, what are we going to do with these people? Fortunately, it leveled off and settled back to mere 5,000 a year in North America. Other conventions, San Diego Comic-Con is vastly bigger, and others is Dragon Con in Atlanta, which uh, also huge, 25,000 people, but I think we're just, or at least some people think we have to grow, other say, no, 5,000 is fine. We can live with 5,000, and I guess will for the uh, foreseeable future. In the 60s, we got another thing that impacted fandom, we called, well, the doper decade. Because suddenly there was 
drugs were affecting uh, people, you know, maybe there were always a few Las Vosians who smoked a little weed, but that was about it. But, uh, there was some, for a while, LA fandom split into three clubs. The old time beer drinker fans with the guitars, uh, the more modern chemical, recreational chemistry users were uh, the Valsfa, sometimes the Valley <coughs> Science Fiction Association, other times the Valley Sleazy Freaks Association. <laughs> and then in the middle was the Lospus, which sort of tried to ignore everything, but yeah, it affected all of science fiction. Uh, but eventually we just established rules that what you do in your house is your business. But uh, there were too many teaching credentials and top secret clearances in fandom for people to want to get involved in, and they don't. So don't involve people who don't want to be involved. And it's gone all the way. I was one of the people who didn't want to be involved, so uh, I only have the vaguest idea of uh, which parties or that sort. They're the ones I'm not invited to. But then, in the 60s, we started our own amateur press association, which was weekly, which was almost like a, like the internet, but the internet didn't exist yet. <laughs> so it was uh, very fast. At times, it went up to 100, 150 pages a week, which is an awful lot of reading. And by that time, this, the next two pages are a photo cover from, as it says, Apple L. Wow, we're 19. And it shows you, oh yeah, fans look like all sorts of things. You know, is, you can't really say what fans look like. Uh, this is from the 70s. Of course, the two people were pictured by Larry Niven, who's a well known science fiction writer. It was the first page. Second row from the bottom, far right, and oh. his partner, Jerry Parnell, second page, first row, second from the left. And since they generate lots and lots of words, and they need lots and lots of characters, some of the other people who were shown here ended up as characters in Niven and Parnell novels. <laughs> uh, all writers do it, it's not unique to fandom. One fellow, uh, on the first page with the Apple L419, third row, second from the right. Tom Digby is the most unusual human I have ever met. <laughs> he, Phi Beta Kappa in electronic engineering, a very creative person. He just couldn't touch anything without changing. Uh, one of his things was he like to think of practical applications for fantasy ideas, uh, such as coin-operated crypts for uh, traveling vampires. <laughs> and uh, sometimes <laughs> would uh, just hit, and everybody would go, yes, why, like in when Apple Hell ages ago, he proposed, why don't they sell advertising space on postage stamps? And everybody went, why don't they? Why don't they? <laughs> if it makes postage uh, cheaper, sure, I don't say it. I care of my stamp say drink Coca-Cola. You know, uh, and he had uh, in one of his apartments, he, he compo made compositions for the organ. And he had one wall of his living room rigged as a light show. But, uh, and so as he played the organ, the thing would respond to it. And it would be fabulous. Wow. But he shows up in one of Larry Niven's stories. He is the robot intelligence test who asks, but what can you say about chocolate-covered manhole covers? And that's an actual <laughs> thing to <the> align. <laughs> yes. That's a great uh, bumper sticker. <laughs> who uh, included it. And also, uh, one piece of Digby's poetry is at the opening of uh, Children of the State. Uh, you need little teeny eyes for reading little teeny print. You need little teeny hands for milking mice. <laughs> and that's another Digbyism. <laughs> and he used to write serious articles like he was describing things for the folks back in his home dimension. Like I remember 
He had one. It was, if you are invited to a wine and cheese party, how do you tell the wine from the cheese? And he spent the next <laughs> couple of thousand <laughs> words explaining to you how you might if you didn't otherwise know how to determine these things. But uh, yeah, he did lots of things like that. Another fellow, of course, the place where the um, uh, characters encountered the Digby Android was Bruce and Diane Pelz's divorce party. And yeah, we're, we have divorce parties. And that one, yes, they had a cake with the bride and groom facing away from each other. We'll throw a party for anything. <laughs> That's great. But on the second page, uh, let's see, third row down, second from the right, is Dan Anderson, another character who does the theory work behind Niven and Parnell novels. Uh, he is the Alderson of the Alderson Drive and the moat from God's Eye, and that he's been dead for thousands of years. And he is Dr. Daniel Forrester, uh, a JPL rocket scientist, which is what Dan really was, uh, in uh, Lucifer's Hammer. And yeah, that's, uh, when you get down to a diabetic astrophysicist who lives in Tahunka, you're getting pretty specific <laughs> that only Dan Alderson on the entire planet would fit those conditions. <laughs> <laughs> Time marched on, and of course, the computer, the information revolution, really change things in fandom. It's not that we never imagined such things. Of course, we used them when they became available. But the main thing is that while fans may always have been nerds, they were poverty-stricken nerds. But then came computers. Suddenly, we were affluent nerds. Our conventions started going upscale. And yeah, our idea of what a good party was uh, like also went upscale. So, yeah, generally uh, we've started recruiting differently because traditionally the common Neil fan was a 13-year-old man. But people who get into fans <laughs> these days are more likely to be 30-year-old systems analysts. <laughs> but the last couple of pages of my handout all right, next to the last, or uh, third from the last shows scenes of our current library. Uh, and only one row is, I think, three rows, although going the length of it. Uh, we're going to have uh, twice as much space for a library uh, in the new building, and we, of course, have, you know, lots of books that we never uh, were able to display just because we didn't have the room. And the next to the last, she chose a meeting of at the current clubhouse. Uh, meetings run 50 to 70 people, you know, just about or every Thursday night. And we delight in diddling with procedure. We can't leave anything alone. I once walked walked into a meeting and they were hotly debating a motion to suppress, a motion to suppress. <laughs> and one young fellow eventually asked, wouldn't it be a little clearer if we knew what the original motion was? <laughs> uh, to which the sense of the meeting was knowing what you were talking about was cheating. It's cheating. So they went on <laughs> arguing for another 10 minutes. I, I walked out by that time, so I had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> But, so that is Los Angeles. We're sure that, uh, yeah, the new building and the new times, of course, now we're in a period, you know, bowling alone, where, you know, people, well, while the internet is good for many things, you still like to get together physically with people, as with us here and other places. And, you know, I don't think it's going to be permanent that, uh, people, you know, don't congregate for one reason and another again. So I'll open it up to comments, questions, uh, 
Yes. Terry, Terry Ellsworth, you had a question. Say it loudly. Yeah. Yeah. Was there an East Coast, West Coast bias? I mean, we had JPL and the East Coast had what, like MIT? And then, of course, we had Hollywood, which was a distinct advantage when it comes to science fiction. Because, you know, it was, we had Forrest here and famous yeah. monster magazines and, you know, most of the, those science fiction films that were aimed at my generation, 12 year olds at the time. I mean, that was all on the West Coast. Was well, that? the movie business moved here because of the weather, because they shot outdoors and uh, they didn't have the big uh, lights that, uh, you know, modern movie sets have, so, and since it rained fairly seldom, that's why they came here. The earliest movie industry was in New York. Yeah, that's interesting. Publishing still is in New York. Uh, other things exist. Cincinnati has a big fandom, surprisingly big. Uh, why Cincinnati rather than many other Midwest towns? But there's a whole cycle of small conventions in the Midwest. It's sort of like, Party's at our house next week, let's go. And so you can go from, on various weekends, uh, since the individual clubs aren't very big, but if you go within 100 miles, you can go to a dozen conventions a year and get the effect of a regular club. But, uh, but, but is there specifically, I think Carrie's question was, is there specifically anything in New York City today or in the past that touches your, your organization and what's done sure. here? But, uh, the Science Fiction League, of course, started in New York, but the Chapter One uh, self-destructed almost instantly when the Futurians tossed Charles Hornig out of the first meeting, and he was the guy who was organizing it. Uh, and then a battle between uh, the Futurians, uh, who were communists, uh, Don Walheim, Frederick Pohl, uh, Robert Blounders, John B. Michelle was really the most doctrinaire communist of the group, uh, he actually came up with the idea of the Worldcon in 39. Well, okay, wow. that first five fans from New York had decided to drive down and visit three fans in Philadelphia. In a fit of something or other, they declared it the first national convention. And since it was at Milt Rothman's house, Milt Rothman was the chairman of the first national. And so their first uh, gathering had been so successful that they thought about organizing another convention in connection with the 1939 World's Fair and, uh, in New York. But uh, actually uh, the argument Leeds in England had a convention about the same time. But it, they actually got a uh, meeting room, passed out flyers, had a program, it was more their claim is, I think, better to be the first science fiction convention. But anyway, Wolheim started out with the idea of the Worldcon. But Moskowitz, his enemy, uh, started opposing him, of course, and went to the publisher saying, you don't want a commie like Don Wolheim uh, in charge of this Worldcon. So you want to back me. So the first Worldcon, uh, Let's see, happened Caravan Hall in New York, 4th of July weekend, 1939. And Moskowitz was the chairman. He later became very well known as, of course, a scholar in the field. And Will Sikora and uh, Larry Terese were his co-conspirators on that. But they actually banned the Futurians uh, from the first Worldcon because you know, under, and be described as troublemakers. This was for a while known as the Great Exclusion Act, later the First Exclusion Act. <laughs> but a guy who fellow traveled with the Futurians was Isaac Asimov. But he couldn't afford to really be a member of the Futurians because he could have been deported. Whereas Wolheim and the rest were Native Americans. They could, you know, might get in a little trouble, but they couldn't be sent back to Russia because they'd never been in Russia. <laughs> so uh, the conventions went from there. The first Worldcon had about 100 people. But OK, clubs, you had the Futurians, which there are five books devoted to the Futurians. Sam Moskowitz's The Immortal Storm, 
uh, Fred Pohl's Remembrance of Futures Past, Isaac Asimov's uh, Memories and still, green. Yeah, still Green, Damon Knight's The Futurians, and Harry Warner Jr.'s All Our Yesterday. So for a club that never had more than 25 members and only existed for two years, <laughs> it had an impact. Uh, but you had Moskowitz hung out at the uh, Queen's SFL, which was uh, about as active as the Lospis in those days, later withdrawing down to the Eastern Science Fiction Association in Newark. There's been a group at City College of New York pretty continuously for quite a while. It was uh, the Lunarians, who by now are just a group of maybe a dozen people who put on the annual Lunacons, which finally got tired of New York City and moved across to Jersey. And then uh, there was the Fist of Class group, which met at various homes around there. But somehow New York's fandom was always fragmented and didn't get along very well. For most of LA fandom's history, uh, it was, uh, well, its detractors say monolithic. That even when there are other clubs, usually the feelings between the Lossifus and other clubs are not all that bad. Uh, in fact, uh, sometimes the, the other clubs, like the Outlanders, were just because people lived too far away to come to Thursday meetings. And so uh, they formed another club. The Petards, aside from the doper issue, also tended to have the same configuration as the Outlanders. Okay, other questions? Thank Comments? I flabbergasted them. <laughs> I have a question. Oh, okay. Could you share your favorite Forrest Ackerman anecdote? Oh, well, I know how I met him. Uh, I was ditching high school. Uh, this was 1959, and a friend of mine were out and about. We ditched a lot of high school. I'd uh, found out in my senior year that he who controls paperwork controls the world, so I signed myself out of my senior year of high school. <laughs> and uh, this worked pretty well since uh, my teachers didn't have to contend with me anymore. My grades really went up. <laughs> and, but my friend uh, read uh, Variety, and Forey Ackerman had an, uh, an ad for his agency and he gave his home address uh, to Glendale uh, before. And so he said, gee, let's go over and visit him. And being brash teenagers, we did. And uh, by now it seemed sort of strange to me. We just knocked on the front door and said, hi, we've heard you're the world's greatest science fiction fan. And he gave us a tour of the place, which wowed me, I was already a a collector, but not like that. I mean, back then, completist collecting was ill-advised. By now, it's total insanity. There's a thousand new titles every year, you know. You gotta have a mansion and a million, several million dollars to get that. But anyway, so he gave us a tour, and he also gave me the address of the Lospis, which at that time was being on 12th Street, just near Vermont. And I remember, and I went there, which I didn't go until the week after I graduated from high school, with the guy who put me a visit to Ackerman's. I looked around the neighborhood and went, I can see this is a slum. You know, I was a valley boy and I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't like the look of that area. And so we went up to the door and I knocked on the door and it opened. And there stood a guy who looked like the guys that your parents told you not to accept candy from. <laughs> and that was Zeke Lapine who owned the house. Uh, funny how people who own houses influenced our history. But I had a momentary urge to say, would you like to subscribe to the Daily News? <laughs> but I didn't. I, I confessed up that I wanted to find the uh, meeting of the Los Angeles Science Fantasy Society and he invited us into his parlor and well, all else followed. Uh, others, well, Ackerman was still attending meetings at that time. 
Uh, after about probably the mid 60s, he didn't regularly attend mm -hmm. hospice anymore. Of course, he'd been the driving force in the 40s, and uh, you know, uh, he, uh, Walt Dorchery, and the lawyer were the uh, triumvirs who essentially ran the place for you know, quite a few years. Okay. Didn't he become almost a celebrity himself? I mean, there was no almost. Yeah. Uh, the man was a, a real. Uh, well, he was quite good at self promotion. Yeah, but I mean, his 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 uh, him uh, promoting himself and things him to a point where he would actually be with the lineup. The cast of an, at, at a premiere of a uh, science oh, yeah. fiction film. And uh, he ends up uh, doing cameos in all sorts of uh, yeah. films. Movies and things like because, uh, you know, the kids who had read Famous Monsters of Filmland grew up to make movies. And so he ends up, I think, in uh, Innocent Blood, where he uh, has the immortal line, That's my car. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he, uh, there were other fans, of course, Moskowitz and Walheim both collected as much as Akron did. Uh, Bob Tucker was widely known as the number one or two fan face. He finally settled for being fan face 1.2. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, are there are there any other questions? I think Jimmy want to get onto your scrolls. Okay. And so, is, is this library? What what are the other? Do you have to become a? How how, how could one visit the library? And just, uh, and just well, visit anybody can walk in when we're open. But uh, if you want to check out books, you have to join. It's no, sure. Good. But but and and so you know you you've you mentioned a lot of of, of almost chapbook chapbook like periodicals that. The, the um, Abbots. The, the, yeah. Are, are these available just in on site to look at? Or is, is there an uh, archive of L? your pub? Yeah. Well, Appa L is up to, what is it, 2,500 by now? 2,405 or 6. Okay, so. Is, is, is there an active archive? Or yes. one could? Oh, yes. Yeah. In Some of it, uh, well, the club had a general circulation fanzine <clears throat> up into the 70s. But it's funny that we could afford doing it back then and we couldn't afford it back now or now uh, just doing a publication is 30 40 pages and uh, on paper and mailing it out to just too expensive but many of those things are first done uh, shipped by email or uh, posted to efanzines.com which is the way many fancy publishers circulate things uh, Appel, yeah, the circulation on that's fairly low, but there are files of the, the clubhouse going all the way back to number one in 1990. Also, there is a uh, complete run that is being kept up at the Eaton Collection down at uh, down in Riverside. Yeah. Oh, the Eaton okay. Collection in Riverside has as close to everything as is imaginable. It acquired Bruce Pell's his fancy and collection, and he was uh, fancy and being an amateur uh, publication in the field. Uh, Fred. Yeah, and so uh, they have more of that. And Fred Patton, who was probably the number one anime collector and also had a very extensive science fiction collection. Uh, he had three garages, I think, full of, or three maybe storage containers. Uh, vast amount of uh, material, I think it was, uh, it was 900 file boxes. Wow. And he collected things like toys uh, related to science fiction and fantasy series and t-shirts from conventions and convention name badges and convention publications and just, you know, more stuff than I ever thought about. <laughs> Uh, collecting, and I managed to fill a three-bedroom house and live by myself. <laughs> so, uh, what finally put a curb to my collectorism was either I knock it off or I start sleeping in the backyard. So at that point I decided maybe I don't really need all of this stuff, and now I'm in the sort of process of 
donating some stuff, which I donated to MSU, which has an extensive popular culture collection, and to CSUN out in Northridge. They had very little to begin with. Rather strange, uh, a complete run of Planet Stories, which is a thud and blunder pulp magazine from 39 to 52, but uh, which did publish <coughs> Ray Bradbury's early works, a lot of them. And then uh, 32 other items that were also mostly all Bradbury. So they had a lot of room, you know, for a million volume library, that's not much of a representation for science fiction. Uh, I've done a fair amount of stuff to them. Yes. I just want to Yes. I want to right. say that when you go to a meeting on Thursday night, they'll give you a copy of the APA L. Oh, good. Okay. And you can go to several meetings for free, and then the membership to join is only five dollars. Oh, yeah. Oh, so it's what? it's not oh, like some. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it used to be uh, we had two requirements for uh, being a member. I think you were breathing, and you had five dollars. <laughs> but then somebody offered to buy a membership for the Star Wars character Yoda. So we decided to waive the requirement for breathing. <laughs> but yes, there are dues for each meeting. But, uh, it's impossible to sleep. And you can uh, stay a member inactively forever for free. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, Bill. I think we have to we have to get on to Gene. But while we set up for Gene. People can still ask you questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That, that, that was very good. And and while we set up for Gene, if people want to keep asking Bill questions, feel free because it's going to take us at least uh, four or five minutes to get set up. And and Mill, I'll run you and Joe back once in, in, in about half an hour or so once we're, we're squared up here with Gene. So Mill, thank you so much. That's a that's a fascinating topic. Yeah, one of my favorites. In my mind's eye, I know several of them. Uh, but let's let's get started. Terry, I would like you, since you've, you've curated Gene before, just just around the corner, Dr. Morris's office just down at 7th and Broadway. Uh, you've curated the, uh, some of these scrolls. Do you want to tell us about this, this, these great scrolls? And, and Gene, this is really a return, because about, what, four months ago? No, January. January, oh my gosh. Seven months ago, yeah. you came and, and people submitted. Yeah, I'll explain I, all that. Yeah, yes. perfect. All right, so Terry. Terry, let, would you mind starting right over here? And we'll, we'll work no, our way no, down no. the table? Uh, Thank you. We're lucky tonight, because those of you who have yeah. never yeah. met or don't know I, Gene, I, this Gene Scalati's work, I think, Karen? I'm sorry, you're totally blown out by the light. Thank you, Ryder. Um, if you're not familiar with Gene Scalati's work, um, you, you, everyone in this room has something in common. We've all done what Gene did, but we left it behind. Every, everyone clock as they turn the music off on. Thank oh, you. Yes. 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 I like it. Thank you. But, uh, <laughs> Not only is he a great artist, but he's a great architect, he's a great city planner, and he's a great visionary. Uh, as I said, uh, one of the things about childhood is you, many times you leave your imagination behind, it shrivels, it goes away. When we're young, <clears throat> many of us have secret friends, we have imaginations that uh, we tend to lose. Uh, Mr. Scalati has not, left, has not lost that. It's much to our gain, and I would like for him now to unfold his past, our past, our present, and our future. Thanks. 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 Well, um, I, for those of you who don't know about this thing, I'll just give you a real brief primer, too. Perfect, yes. <laughs> it's, it's the light behind you. You're oh, invisible, you say. Right. Um, the these are these, uh, I guess Terry, now this is called vernacular art. At one time it was called naive art. At one time amateur, I think. But at any rate, uh, these are drawings of fictitious urban settings that I've been doing since I was about nine years old in Northern California. 
and then I moved down here in uh, 1973. And intermittently, I keep doing them. I'm, I'm getting Social Security now, so you can figure out how long that's been. Um, and they are kind of a, an accretion of all sorts of things that just appeal to me, mainly urbanity or, or urban scenes and, and sort of city-like things. I grew up in a small town in Northern California, so um, cities always had an appeal to me. The inspirations for most of what I've done have been California, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Sacramento, um, and uh, but I also take models from other places like I, uh, New York and Tokyo, things like that. And it's very primitive, uh, but it's just sort of a lot of fun. At any rate, in January, January 30th, we had a, a lava salon, and I passed out these um, building permits to people. Which <laughs> my idea was, uh, tell me something you'd like to see drawn on the current cityscape, which is. Uh, it's uh, called Majestic Boulevard Extension. The original Majestic Boulevard, which I showed in January, it's about 60 feet long, and I decided just to kind of hack it off and start a new part, and Majestic Boulevard Extension 2, we asked for people to uh, tell us what you'd like to see built there, and some folks, uh, about 20 folks came through and gave us suggestions and drew little things. I see some people sitting here today whose suggestions I didn't get to yet. Oh, that man. adult <laughs> entertainment complex is coming. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't adult. It was, it was a, it's a party a complex. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. But uh, so, so anyway, so to speak. Yeah, we got about we had about bum, twenty. Bum. We had about twenty of them, and uh, you know, unlike everybody else, I had other stuff to do, so I haven't been able to draw too many. But I will just read you briefly the ones that you can see on here when we pull the extension out here. Um, Ian Whitcomb, who isn't here today, had, uh, funny for Ian, because it's such an egotistical suggestion, he had, why don't you do the world headquarters of Ian Whitcomb Industries, which is a factory with uh, smokestacks and, and everything, and it's the headquarters of Ian. Well, that is here, you'll be able to see that. Uh, ITW Industries. Eddie Michel, the great uh, Neil McCabe, sometimes goes by the name of the French singer Eddie Mitchell. He asked that we draw the Johnny Halliday convalescent home. <laughs> and also, could you put in a Yay Yay record shop? We got them both. They're oh, here. Yeah. Awesome. We got those. And um, uh, Chuck Kelly, who's not here, who runs Luxuria Radio Station. Chuck wanted uh, a radio station with a broadcasting tower on the top, so we did uh, that uh, for him. Uh, Jim Trombetta, who's here, wanted the Gentry condos, a glossy Futuro exterior of interiors that have a bathroom in every room designed by Berlusconi himself. I didn't get that far into it, but, but we did draw the condo. Uh, among the many billboards he wanted to see, which is, are, one is in here, this is advertising the forthcoming movie Quanto, the man who can be in two places at once. That's in there. And, uh, Terry himself, Terry Ellsworth said, could you draw um, Edie's Thrift Shop? That was a John Waters famous Edith Massey. I did a lot of research online and all I could find were interior shots of Edie's place. So I had to kind of jury rig what I, so, but it's here, the Edie's uh, is here. And then, I don't know if this guy's here, is Dwayne Crum here? here. Dwayne's here? here. Oh, there you are, yeah, great. Uh, he had a great one, which was, I waited till the end. Not. Pardon? He always does. Yes. No, he had a great suggestion, and, and it took me a long time to do it because it's, it's very ambitious, and you'll see that I've started it. It's something I wanted to do kind of anyway, but I'm thankful to Dwayne. A port or a harbor like Los Angeles or San Pedro. So in, in my vernacular way, you'll see that when we unroll this. So what we're going to do first is unroll this uh, majestic boulevard extension, which has these building uh, projects that have been developed and it's not too long. And then I'm gonna show uh, another one. This is, uh, it was called Untitled Number One. And this is uh, 13 inches by 53 feet. I worked on this from December 1969 to January 1971. And uh, it's the last work that I did in Northern California. And it's very Southern California obsessed. Um, I made a lot of trips down here before I moved here. So a lot of things that you'll see in here are things that dominated the California, particularly Southern California landscape then, like lots of discount centers, lots of white front stores and knock off white fronts and stuff like that. I think the Mansard Roof Franchise Restaurant Riff was just coming in, so you might see some of that. Actually, there are. There, uh, it was a time of uh, Roy Rogers Roast Beef and all those places, so some of those are There's a Tom Mix Burger chain that's in here. So there's a lot, of, a lot of different things like that. Um, Did you make that up? 
Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. And um, there's also another thing in, in this, the second one again, um, which was really great. I love this about the South Bay. It was so wonderful at one time. And that was um, these great, uh, great broad boulevards that would have uh, large expanses of um, nothing. Just, just, just nothing, or like grass fields, and even some grazing area where there might still be cattle in some places, or horses at least, anyway. And then broken up by, you know, these one-story buildings for, uh, you know, computer systems. That's just like 19, early 1970s, late 60s. So you'll see a lot of them in here. I call them, I think I call them cybernetic, cyber meadows or something later. I didn't know what they were, but just this great open space, and then something, then nothing, then something. So that's in here. Uh, there's also my failed attempt at Laurel Canyon or something like it in here. Um, I visited many times and I wanted to do Laurel Canyon because there's great, it's like forest in the middle of the city and it's highly populated. Also, but the thing that ruined it for me was foliage. Trees are very, very hard. Lots of trees are hard to do. So um, you'll see it in here. It looks like a, there's kind of a hill area and a bunch of houses. It's very denuded. It looks like <laughs> red rocks or something. Very like rotten. Anyway, so let's start with... Uh, Majestic Gene, Boulevard Gene, extension. Do you think that people should just come forward? Yeah. I think yeah, but eating please. Their, their beverages and food at the table. Yes, yeah. I'll just unroll them here. Hands we'll... in their pockets. Do you have any questions? But yeah, let's let's yeah, just that's... everyone let's just let's just assault the table. <laughs> uh, everyone make make oh. their way out. I'd rather pepper it, but that's okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So this is the current one that I'm still working on. This has some of the stuff in it. You'll see. Um, oh, yeah. uh, here. Oh, this is one of the ones I forgot. Uh, this was a Count Smokula who was here. He wanted me to do the uh, the embassy for Smok Smoke Sylvania, so we did it. That's there. How how is the count? I guess he's okay. I emailed him about this, but I didn't hear from him. Here's a. Uh, Jim had another uh, thing, which was, could you do a billboard for the forthcoming album by Sir Reptitious, the new rapper? So, uh, <laughs> Sir Yeah. Uh, here's Johnny Holiday's rest home. Uh, the Yee Yee Record Shop is somewhere around here. Here's just Holiday Tom of us. Yeah, well, here's the record store, right? Yeah. And uh, Jim's condos are here. Here's the Quanto uh, billboard ad. Here's Ian Wickham in the industries is here, and here's the radio station Chuck Kelly one at the Yeah, and then there's one and then down here is Dwayne's court. I, I gave myself some space. Here, take uh, here's the port area that Dwayne wanted. I am working on that. Oh, very cool. But yours I'll get to these. Oh, All right. right. Yeah. Well, it was a red light district, not necessarily yeah, yeah. No, I, a dull I, 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 24 hour club and party spot. Yeah, yeah. Anything else could happen. Yeah. <laughs> what you do behind your red light is your <laughs> Well, you know, it's yeah. what LA is missing. Yeah. It really is. There's no reason why it should close down at 10 o'clock. So I, I started this well, recently. Well, great. And I, I wanted to do the real harbor stuff first, but I realized you got to draw the top before you draw the bottom because otherwise you're room. So I had to do kind of the stuff that you also find around harbors. Right? Mm -hmm. Then you got to have like a real Super seedy stuff. little Thanks board walk. Really yeah. Like <laughs> yeah. yeah. hot dog on a stick restaurant. Yeah. Or actually got a dog on a pole. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll probably do some more beach. This is great. This is the main street that runs through this and the, and the uh, Majestic Boulevard itself. It's Majestic Boulevard. You need a through line, so that's it. The hills and things. ACFK. Yeah, Chuck Kelly. Uh, Chuck uh, F. So Kelly. This used to be a uh, the Raiders Temple? Yeah, probably. Yeah, right. Yeah. I have a plan for this one. This is like the famous uh, Marblehead chain, Super South. Oh, so but then I'm going to do a knockoff one called Superb oh. Stuff. <laughs> so well, like Tommy Burton. Yeah. 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 Thor yeah. number 16 is what is it? Yeah, Thor 16. Way up there. Yeah. Actually, it looks like Caesar's Burgers. Yeah, I'll made do an old Dorito Schnitzel. Was there one? Was it with the A frame? It was the A frame yeah. old Dorito Schnitzel, and then a guy who was there named Caesar who started turning turned well, it into Caesar's, Caesar's Burger, and they painted it bright purple. Uh -huh. And uh, it was the best burgers. 
Caesar's 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 Caesar's
A smog. Uh, yeah, I, I, because I really love Southern California. I still like it, but when I lived before I moved here, I loved coming over the grapevine and getting that uh, ozone smell because uh -huh. it meant you're here now. You know. And, uh, so anyway, so later towards the, the other end, uh, there's a whole section where I drew the normal stuff, basically houses and shopping centers and palm trees. The only color that I colored in was green, uh, so that you could see foliage. And then I used watercolor to come up with this kind of pink gray wash on it, which is a small color. Did I miss Ian Woodcomb International Enterprises? Yeah, you'll have to unroll that other one to see. Well, I'm not surprised that was the inspiration. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's really fun. Uh, Do you know this, do uh, you have a rock club well, here? If you, if you leave it over to Lake about so. Probably a couple, couple The Grateful Dead and the Burrito Brothers? Oh yeah, that was a bill, because they, they might have played it. This kind of reminds me of the family dog on the Great Highway. It's probably what it was. Yeah, I think that that's a big hit. Yeah, it turns like a yellowish, and then actually if you use certain like powders, you can use like a... I think this is like an acid, the smog thing is with the acid, it's very important document. Yeah, it depends. Yeah, well, they were just the smog parts. Some people leave it out. You can also just use construction. Yeah. And the stuff that's not protected starts to yellow. It's brittle. So you can spray it on the plastic coating. Yeah, I think it's a good design. <laughs> so here's the beach area. Oh, here's a. Well, that's what became. That's the attempt at Laurel Canyon, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I just again, I, the sort of South Bay stuff, and also the stuff in the like Maria Del Rey before it got too developed. It's just like this. I really like just the almost spontaneous way it looks like it came together. Yeah, yeah. Still, you know, just like so the kind of South Bay. Here and, yeah, yeah. It looks like it was improvised. And of course, like it probably was. Yeah. Well, yeah, with the help of real estate corporations. Yeah. Hey, Gene, can you describe your physical process for creating this stuff? What are you What are you doing? Well, I just draw with pen and crayon and a little bit of watercolor. Now I use I also use these Prismacolor pencils that are you can use with water, which are really it's been a real boom to draw stuff with them. And you work at a drafting table? No, I lay on the floor, as you know. I know. I uh, lay on the floor in my stomach like a kid before the hearth. And uh, that's it. I, when I started doing this again, I hadn't done it in about 20 years. I started doing it in 2006, I think it was. I told my wife, I said, well, maybe we should get a drawing table because um, I, I'm old now. I'm going to lay on the floor with these <laughs> muscles and stuff, but it works. <laughs> you get up and you have a coke or something, you go back to work. They have those kids' tables that have the rolls. Um, yeah. That are pretty nice, actually. You know the scale? Well, I'm, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. This is like really a little fusion. Well, it's for, for kids, yeah, but you know, you can put a roll of butcher ball. It's funny, in some places, you'll draw the stop signs and lines on the street. Or maybe it's under the table. Like nice. There's another discount store that was being built in the old This is a school bus. The one time you did these things were yours. This is this is the same. Fires, earthquakes. This is sort of the Armageddon. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if this is an earthquake. I think what this was was um, a project that ran out of money. Oh, was. <laughs> They're coming up again that day. Um, <laughs> Still Gene, destruction on a mass scale. Right? Gene, do you work from drawings, or are you making up most of this um, as you go? Most of this is is, is yeah, it comes out of my head. What's the bird? Lately, I have. Lately, though, I have construction. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I've taken things. Uh, in the main um, Majestic Boulevard, when I, I took uh, big condos out of uh, New York Times Magazine real estate ads, you know, live here is only $2 million for 100 square feet, that kind of stuff. And um, a lot of things like that. I took up some uh, high rises out of uh, Shanghai and uh, chi uh, China urban. It's like, a, uh, like a, an empty. Um Oh, here's a small coat, if anyone right, right. cares. Ah. It starts here and goes over there. Yeah, yeah. It, you're right. <laughs>
It's got a pinkish. It's good. A little bit of yeah. I mean, gray. It's a chain. Yeah. yeah, number one was over here. That's number two. Maybe that's number one there. All of a sudden realizing that I'm living under a blanket. It was that bad. It was a blanket. You saw like a few little, you know, building spires yeah. coming out of it. But it was just like. Well, I grew up in the valley, and there would be a few days a year where. Suddenly you'd see the mountains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you really didn't know they were there. Because you didn't know they were there. Really really like, there. there. Yeah. Like, oh, you know, we also had an incinerator in our backyard. Oh, right. Really? really? Yeah. 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 I mean, I... One of those brick yeah. ones. It was, that was what you did with trash. You had garbage collection one day, trash collection the other day, and you incinerated the upper. I mean, I'm not that old. It's so good. Well, I am. Why have you incinerated? I mean, that's... You know, they got my, my grandparents' house had. They forced us to get rid of the incinerator after a while because it was yeah, illegal. What's that? Oh, we had water pump. Oh, okay. That's right. I, did, I just so let them cool. Like, my grandmother had a More or less. Yeah. A couple of roofs. Yeah. That that burn, 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 burn. Burn. Great. I just wanted, you wanted, you wanted yeah. kind of a monochrome with a few yeah, things that shine through. But maybe one of the main markets. Yeah, remember all That's great. My current wrestle was. Of course. You know, it goes around. I'm out there climbing on the pyramids. Yeah. So what I think is funny is yeah. sometimes you see people yeah. perverted, but they were sort of perverted. Yeah. Those kinds of things. Yeah. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa! Oh, 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 o